Hey, thank you for being here at week two of our series, uh, First Peter. We began a series last week uh, through the book of First Peter, and we talked about this cultural tension, this tension in our world that exists between uh, the, the culture and the chosen, uh, those in our lives who, who uh, uh, are squeezing and we walking through the fire and what that looks like and that sometimes God wants us to stay in that he has a purpose for that fire. And in the hands of the refiner, that, that those trials, those fires can, can bring out great gold in my life. In fact, there can be greater worth than that even in my trust in Christ and so I, I want to continue uh, this series. I hope you'll uh, come with us. Uh, I, I know it's easier said than done, like our title, uh, but I hope you'll come with us and, and dig. If you want to dig a little bit deeper in this book study in First Peter, come on Sunday nights. Tonight is virtual only, but we'll have uh, that option forward coming in person. And so I hope that you'll join us uh, tonight, starting tonight, in beginning. Now they're going to start at the beginning of First Peter. They're going to they're going to dig in a little bit further. So if you really want to get to know First Peter, then don't I can't do it all on Sunday morning. I promise you that. Come along with us for the journey and really uh, dig in to what Peter has to say. Peter wrote this book in a time of tension uh, to Christians throughout Asia Minor who are scattered around these different areas in Asia Minor who are walking through the fire. And it was right before the persecution that would lead into a, uh, a horrific climax of persecution where Nero would kill thousands and thousands of Christians. But leading into that time was just a government who didn't acknowledge them, uh, a people who put pressure on them and who didn't acknowledge God, and living in a godless culture and the fire that you walk through in that culture. And yet, First Peter, we get to chapter 2, and these are the words of Peter in chapter 2. Therefore, since you're going through these trials and God's purifying you, remember chapter one, and he wants all of this to come for your good. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Boy, isn't this going to be fun to dig into tonight? <laughs> <laughs> like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. That's what I'm hoping you get on a Sunday morning. I hope you just get a taste that the Lord is good and come back and dig in. Look at, look at all the things you've got to rid yourself of. You don't even, what is malice? What is deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander? Um, essentially, he's just telling you, get off social media. That's pretty much. <laughs> I think the word is, if, if, here's my simple application. Get off social media, uh, start reading your Bible, taste and see that the Lord is good, Okay. <laughs> But we're going to dig into that tonight a little more. I, won't, I want to stay and preach this, but uh, it goes on to verse 4 and says this. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I preached on this back in the fall uh, in October. You can go and, and, and look at the sermon and, read and do that. Uh, in fact, I, I saw, I, feel, I don't know what's going on. I see preachers preaching on Peter right now a lot. I don't know. I had a good idea, I guess. Uh, I saw Pastor Furtick preach on this passage. So if you want a good sermon on that, he talked about how, you, uh, how we're built different as Christians and how we're built on Christ. And I want you to go back and dig into this and come back tonight and dig in. But here's where I want to focus our time tonight in verse 9. Here's what it says. But you, but you are a chosen people. Say, I'm chosen. I'm chosen. I'm not the frozen chosen. Okay, I I'm chosen, all right? I am chosen. I am a royal priesthood, a holy 
nation. God's special possession. Let that sink in for a moment. That's what God says about you. That's what God says about you. You are his special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. (laughs) Once you were a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you were not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. But Peter writes these words to these churches in this tension. The the tension between our culture and being chosen. Between a godless culture and a God-centered special possession, a holy people. See, we were, this world was built for you, but you weren't built for this world. 1 Peter chapter 1, you haven't experienced your best day yet, remember? Okay, there's coming a time when you will be in the place, and if you don't believe me, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I will come again. But while we're in this world, right? While we're in this world, you're like, I wish it worked that way, Pastor Shane. I wish we could just think about heaven and all the tension would fade away. But that's not real life, right? That's not real life. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. What is real life? What is real life? Now, probably if you have kids, you've played this game before, right? Um... I, I'm sad to say I have I have played it. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm sad to say I don't know what happened to all my little people. I think they fell away. Uh, my little people fell away. But but you get you get a car. You know it's really cool. You get a car, and uh, and in the car you get to put the people and you get the blue and the pink. I remember my boys uh, when your boys are like ah oh, they don't want to put the pink ones in. Like, okay, mom's okay. That's all right. That's fine. But now, no, I don't want a sister. You know, I, I, and, and, and God answered their prayers for some reason. We got all boys. But, but you fill up the car, and then you got to make decisions, right? And, and you get to make a decision, boy, am I going to go to college? Or am I going to take the, the faster track right to my career? And, and maybe I could make more money, but then I got to take out, it says here, uh, pay, uh, um, take out a $100,000 loan. Boy, that's, I don't know when this was written, but that's, that's good. That's, that's about right. Okay. A $100,000 loan, <laughs> but eventually you pay it back and then you can, oh, you have an accident. I'll pay $5,000. Oh, get married. Oh, that's great. You get some money, but then you got to buy a house. Oh, you got to borrow some money again. And you kind of go through this life or you can take some, some different options here. You can have some business options, some, um, some risks. You can decide, Hey, do I want to take risk over here? Do I want to go this path and it's riskier, but I might get more or the less risky path. And I get to make all these decisions in life, right? And, and the, the object of the game, it says, to travel the path of life, making decisions, building a family, earning money, and paying some out too, buying homes, and collecting life tiles, have the highest value at the end of the game, and win. Doesn't that sound familiar? I don't know why we ever thought this was a good idea to play this with our kids. This is not a, I don't think this is, I don't think this is real life in this world. That's true. In this, that's how this world works. Is that real life though? Because it's just a moment, right? I mean, I see here, you can get all the way, this is, this is where the game ends right here. And you can retire, and you can hear, you can retire. You can, oh, oh, I, I, I want to do the millionaire estates. A million, I want to retire the millionaire estates. 
or the or you could do the more uh, more comfortable uh, but economic uh, countryside acres. And boy, I, I'm going to relax. I'm living the good life now. But this is just a moment. So what really is real life then? What's what's real life like? Well, real life, Peter says, is not determined by this culture. In fact, who we are is determined by God, not culture. Who we are is determined by God, not culture. Yeah, you're in this culture, but you're chosen, verse 9, right? That you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. He's saying, this is darkness, oh, but the best I can hope for is I can get to the millionaire estates if I'm really good, if I invest. You get to choose, make some choices, invest some money. You can go to college and get buried in debt, but don't worry, someday you'll work your way out and then you'll make a lot of money. And someday you can be just like me, boys and girls. (laughs) Deep in debt, but happy. And don't worry, I'm working hard for you so someday you can have everything I didn't have. I'm building you a real life. Mm. But that's not where our inheritance is, right? 1 Peter chapter 1. So what does it look like when God declares and determines who I am, not culture? I love that we're raising up a generation in kids' church, very similar to Colossians chapter 3. This was their memory verse. You ought to watch kids' church online, by the way, if you want some exciting television. That's what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, Pastor Lisa As God's chosen holy people, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. She had all the kids putting all the clothes, putting all the warm, the hats on, and getting the gloves on. She got her, she got them dressing up their pets at home. Man, they got they got chosen pets at home. I don't know how that works. Uh, Holy pets. uh, Clothing them with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Why? Because God calls you out. God chooses you, so God is the only one who can determine who you are, not your culture. And we're raising up a generation who knows their identity in Christ. (laughs) So we don't have the confusion about what's real and what's really real. Because this is just temporary. But sometimes, don't we get caught up living like like we were chosen to live here? Like like this world chose us. In fact, we we take on labels all the time, right? You find out, oh, you you know, you you read some of these uh, careers here. Oh, oh, I got a college career. Ooh, (laughs) look at this. I, I just picked it out. I just picked it out. I'm a doctor. Um, not for real, I just play one on television, but, uh, well, I, I guess I am a doctor, but I'm not this kind of doctor. My, my base salary of $100,000. I like this kind of doctor. Oh, but then I got to pay the $45,000 taxes, too, so. Well, that's not great. Hey, you guys seen that video of that kid who, this is, that's actually what made me think of this. I watch this video of this kid, and he's playing life, and then he finds out he's got to pay the, the $45,000 in taxes. He's going, oh, she's like, what's the matter? What's the matter? He's like, I don't want to pay taxes. <laughs> no. 
Boy, real life is hard. But real life is not determined by this culture. My life's already been chosen. God determines who I am, a special people. You say, well, I, you know, do you ever feel just rejected by this culture at times? No? You kind of fit in pretty good? Mm, that's the hard part is because, see, Jesus set a path out and he was rejected. He was rejected, but God said he was chosen, verse 4, 1 Peter 2, 4, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but what? Chosen by God. And what? Precious to him. And then what did he call us in verse 9? Precious to him. Chosen by God. His son, rejected by humans. Let me tell you, when you experience rejection, you are experiencing something in the company of the founder of our faith. If you're finding a group of people to fit in with here in this world that, that you just kind of slide around and by an organization or a group of people that's determined by this culture, I would just, like Peter, give you this warning. Don't be caught up in this life because there is another one that is greater and he is the one who's chosen you, a royal priesthood. You are not for this world. It would make much more sense if you would live in such a way that sometimes this culture reacts to and rejects and doesn't get you because you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and who you are is determined by God, not your culture. Number two, who we are determines what we do. So this is supposed to determine what I do in life. The fact that I'm chosen by God, it's supposed to determine what I do. It's supposed to determine which direction I take and which path I take. It's supposed to determine, not by the spin of a wheel, but in this world, they just spin the wheel. Sometimes it works out. I'm mm, sorry, that's just the way life works. But if I'm chosen by God, how does that determine what I do? Well, verse 11, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, to not fit into this culture. To abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Who's glorifying God? They are. What? What? You mean how I live is supposed to draw people to real life? Yeah, live your life in such a way. Don't give in to, here's why it's so important. Here's what's at stake. It's not like God's mad at you. Oh, you gave in again. I'm so mad at you. I can't believe you did that again. Well, no, we make that, that's way too, per, God isn't just making it about you. He's saying, don't give in to the sinful desires because I want you to live in such a way that's so contrary and so much in contrast to this life that they see real life because you are chosen God's holy people. And so don't try, and hey, listen, like last week, don't get on the treadmill you trying to figure out holiness because I am holy, so I'll make you holy. So be holy for I'm holy. I've chosen you out of this world. 
Don't give in. Live lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify you. They'll, they'll still accuse you. You know what you notice in this verse? Even though you're doing good, they're still going to say you're not. Anybody ever get some false accusations? No, we get that from the church mainly, right? Yeah, isn't the church made up of people just like this world who sometimes give in to trying to find a safe group of people that if they line up with enough, then this is the line up and, and stay protected and it's going to protect all my rights over here and all, my, all the things that I think and all the things that work with my family. As I try to advance my life forward, what's best for me, that's every decision I make in life, what's best for me and my family, because that's what I learned in the game of life. Jesus says, culture shouldn't determine who you are and it shouldn't determine what you do because I've determined who you are and, and I've deter- because I've determined who you are, that, that determines what you do. And I want you to live lives so in such a way that even though they accuse you, that there's just nothing to point at. So they can accuse you. You know how the, the world works, right? I mean, you've been in it. Let's not pretend we don't know how this works. I, uh, I was in business for many years. I worked with a lot of people who their goal was like, if they, if they know like you're trying to live out something uh, pure or good in life, their goal is to bring you down to their level <laughs> as fast as possible. <laughs> like, hey, come on, come on. Come on, get some drink, get, drink some more, drink some more. Hey, come on, let's, let's have some fun. Come on, why are you, you such stick in the mud? Oh, why you have to be so holier than thou? Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, come on out with us. Oh, don't be like that. Oh, don't be, oh, don't be crazy. Oh, we love you more now. We like you. Oh, let me tell you, I respect you even more, Shane, if you just come out with us and hang out with us and do all the same things that we're doing because that makes me feel better. Because I don't like being around somebody who's like this. That makes me feel like I'm missing something. When that's exactly the way God wanted us to live. So the people around you go, wait, wait, what? What is going on with this? What, what are you? And then they get, they get frustrated, so they start accusing Oh, you think you're all this. Let me tell you. And then they put the microscope on you. And will they find a mistake? Of course they will. I follow you around with a camera and follow all of your likes and dislikes and troll you online. Let me tell you, I'll find something you like. I'll find something you do. I'll find something. Oh, I'd love it. I'd love to follow. I'd love to follow you. Say what? What are you talking about? Live lives in such a way that, that you're a contrast to the rest of everyone else around you, that you look different. You're not supposed to look like them. I'm not talking about just the simple things of clothes or, or, or let's be John the Baptist. I mean, there was only one of them. <laughs> and he was weird to them, too. Listen, to the other Christians, they were like, I don't know what's going on with this hairy guy running around in the woods eating honey. It's just weird, but let me tell you, he's pointing the way to Jesus. You don't have to say you have to look a certain way or be a certain way. I'm not saying you don't either. What I'm saying is your life, your life ought to be lived in such a way. So, I, yeah, <clears throat> I'll make decisions along the way, but let me just tell you, this board, I'm not even playing on the same board as you. I'm not limited by this. I'm here. Let me help you along the way. Let me live in... Let me just tell you, God's already chosen me. He's already set me apart. I'm a chosen person. I'm I'm a holy priesthood. I, I, not because I'm holy, not because I'm so perfect, but because He is. I can't explain it. God's changed my life. It isn't... 
I'm not denying myself like, oh, I'm so bored. <laughs> I'm living a life that if you could just get a lot, if you could just taste and see that the Lord is good, if you could just taste it for yourself, it would change you too. So live lives in such a way that who we are is determined by God, not culture. And therefore, who we are determines what we do. And therefore, number three, what we do then reveals who we fear. Verse 13. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Now, I wish you would do it instantly, don't you? <clears throat> Don't you wish that just by living a good life, that instantly all the noise would be that, shh, shh, shut it. I wish that would work. The idea of this word is that it would be continually lived in front, continually over and over, this life of faithfulness that I keep doing the consistent right thing so that at the, at the high school reunion, they're like, man, are you still living that way? I thought that was just a thing. Like, wait, that was for real? I thought you did that just to get out of get out of trouble or something. I thought you just cleaned it up for sports. I thought you just, I thought you cleaned it up because, you know, you met that girl and then she was making you do all that stuff. I, I thought, I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. My value and who I am is not determined by you and how you see. Let me just tell you about a story of someone I met that changed my life. I tried to tell you before, it's not, this is real. This has changed my life. And no, I don't do it perfectly. I fall all the time. Let me tell you, you follow the camera around, you're going to fall, you're going to see me falling all the time. But I have someone, I was a people who didn't have mercy. Now I'm a people who's experienced the mercy of God. And I'm in a family that loves me no matter what I do <laughs> and forgives me. And, ah. Uh, Live as free people, verse 16. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil, though. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of God, of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So let's hang out here for a minute, can we? Show proper respect to everyone. Let's just stop there for a moment. God's saying, you want to show a contrast to the rest of the world? Just respect everybody. You mean the ones who agree with me, right? No, no. I mean, everyone. You mean the ones who believe just like I believe, who, who have Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior and read the Bible, well, not as much as I do, but as much as I say I do. Like, you mean that group of people, right? No, no. Just respect everyone. Respect everyone. Show them respect. You say, well, what does that mean exactly? It means exactly what you taught your kids. Like, stop forgetting what it means. You know what it means. <laughs> we get defined because we, we specialize our situation and go, yeah, but, oh, man, somebody has to tell him, and somebody needs to, and I can't take this, and I can't work for a guy like this, and I can't, uh, I, I can't de deal with this person, and I can't uh, just, oh. they got to earn my respect. Oh, I see. So you want to live the way this world works. Wh 
well, how did that work out exactly? What did you do to deserve God to choose you exactly? You, you were that special? You were more special than the Son of God, Jesus himself? Whoa, pastor. Take it easy. No, that's what God is saying. That you didn't do anything. That he chose you. He chose you. And like his own son, that you are his special possession. Respect everyone. Love the family of the believers. Agape, no matter what they do, no matter what they say, no matter what they believe, no matter how they vote. Agape, love them. Love them. Serve them. Give a, put their right, put what they need above your needs. That's agape love. That's the kind of love that gives. It doesn't take. It just gives and gives and gives and forgives and forgives and forgives and loves and respects and, and loves some more. The same kind of love that God gives you. He says to love your fellow believers and fear God. But honor the emperor. So honor the king, but fear God. Honor the governor, but fear God. Honor your senators, but fear God. Honor the president, but fear God. Now, if I just talked about honor, we'd be in trouble. Come on, y'all. Let's be honest. Give me a break. You don't respect them. You don't honor them. You don't say anything but negative about anybody. It doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter who the governor is. It doesn't matter. I'm meddling. I shouldn't do that. Because, you know, we know how this life works. That's, that's just life. That's just life, Shane. Pastor, come on, that's just life. Free speech. That's just life. I can say anything I want to do. I have freedom, I have respect. I, I, I have the authority to, to say whatever I want to say and do whatever I want to do. That's just life. That's how life works. Live lives in front of the pagans in such a way that They see your respect for everyone, your love for the family of believers, that they see it, and they see your fear of God even above your honor of the emperor. Fear God. Now, fear God is confusing because it's like, oh, wait, I'm afraid of this person because they they will hurt me. I'm afraid of this person virus because it'll get me. I'm afraid of losing something. I'm afraid. I have fear. It's like, that's not the kind of fear he's talking about. Is that I would revere God. That I would revere God. Proverbs 9.1. But the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom that I would revere God above everyone else. Jesus said it himself, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body. And yet... There's a reverent fear that I have, a reverence for the one who created me the way I was, the one who gave his life for me, the one and the only one who gives up everything for me, who chose me. I have a reverent fear. So here's what that looks like in this tension. The Apostle Paul is a perfect example of what this tension looks like because he say, hey, I should obey God rather than man. Remember that? 
So if, if any of these other conflict with God, I don't fear these other people. I don't fear the government. I don't fear other people. I don't fear the believers. I only fear God. I only revere God. He is above all things. He is the only one who determines. And if you happen to line up with God, awesome. But if you don't, I got my eye on one thing. <laughs> it's God's. It's God's. Now, I will respect. Now, it doesn't mean, so then I don't, I don't have to respect him. I don't have to love them. I don't, no, 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 no. <laughs> It, it doesn't take any of that stuff away. I still honor the emperor. I still respect all people. I still love my fellow believer. But what it means is if your life doesn't line up with where God's life lines up for me, then I'm not living this life. I'm living the real life. And I'm fearing the one who put me here. I revere the one. And Paul lives this tension, or Peter lives this tension out, and Paul lives this tension out, and all the apostles, you watch through the book of Acts, and, and Peter himself is in a situation where he's leading the, the young church in, in Acts chapter 5, and, and, and they get caught, and he and the apostles get caught for preaching the word because it's causing a mess, and now the church is huge, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people, and, um, and it's really creating a stir, so the Sanhedrin, the people in the Jewish culture are, are, are feeling like, wow, what's happening? We have division. We already, we already have a government who hates us. Now, now we have people who are over here and all the people are starting to follow this way. And so they said, they brought the men in and they brought Peter in and said, stop preaching this gospel. Stop it. Or we're going to throw you into jail. And we said, and Peter looks at him and says, I, I, I can't do that. Out of total respect, sir, not because of my disrespect of you, but I, I, I fear God above men. And I must continue to share what this truth is. But I'll go to jail if that's what you want. So they go to jail. And then an angel comes in Acts chapter 5. An angel comes and lets them out of jail with the doors still locked. The people come back and they go, where'd they go? Now, if an angel comes and busts you out of jail, you can fear God and go with them, all right? No disrespect intended. The angel told us to go out into the courts and keep preaching. And they said, where are these men at? And they came back and they said, hey, they're... Hey, some, some kid runs in and goes, hey, 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 guys, they're out there preaching again. What? And they go out there, and they're like, wow, and they see all the people who are coming to Jesus, and they're scared. So Acts chapter 5, they get together, and they huddle together. Now they get the full Sanhedrin together. And, and, and they're, what do we do? And, and Gamelia steps up with wisdom on the, on the board He's the voice of wisdom on the board, and he steps up and says, hey, if this is from God, you better not come against it because you won't be able to stop it. But if it's from men, it'll fail anyway. Let them preach your thing. Let them, let them go do this. Let's not, be, let's not be mobbed, okay? Let's not be crazy. And so they decide to take them and flog them and tell them, stop preaching the gospel. And they flog them. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of the gruesomeness of this, but here's what happens next after the flogging, verse 41, Acts chapter 5. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Just no disrespect to you, Emperor, but I'm going to leave here rejoicing after my flogging. They didn't go out into the temple courts and say, listen to this. Did you see what they've done? Let's rally. Let's kill them all. Let's, let's take matters. This is, this is unjust and unfair and horrible and everything. And, and we can, let's rally our, the people to gather. He said, no, no, no. They left rejoicing. 
And then what did they do? They obeyed God and went back to preaching. (laughs) Sure, we'll go to jail. Sure, we'll be flogged. And we'll leave rejoicing. Day after day in the temple courts from house to house, they never stopped preaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Let me tell you, there are people in your life who will never hear those words from this church. Your life is the only sermon they'll ever see. So do you want to show them this? Or something completely different? He shows some extreme contrast here. I mean extreme. Extreme contrast. Read through the rest of 1 Peter 2. He gets into, he says, slaves have reverent fear of God. Submit yourself to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, uh, and, but those who are harsh, for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. Let me tell you, this disgusting thing that happens that people use this passage or that God forgive the church for ever using this passage as saying that slavery is okay. See, there it is. First of all, you have no idea what you're talking about, okay? The, the, The slavery in this context is completely different. Secondly, he's not commending it and not saying anything good about it. He's actually using illustrations of total injustice, And that all slavery is in this category. He talks about women in this culture later. That none of it's okay. Because in God's family, we are all equal. But the point that he's making is so crazy and so ridiculous and so mind-boggling that we would endure unjust behavior and and count us worthy of suffering for Jesus in this life. I, I pray for the end of slavery in our culture. There's still slavery happening. There's still slavery. You see the people raising awareness for it and saying, hey, there's still slavery. There's still human trade. There's still people who are subservient. None of it is okay. We live in this broken world that is so broken and so desperate for God. They are pagans. They are people who live devoid of truth. And and he's saying and calling us as his chosen people, as his royal priesthood, to live in such a way that it brings glory to God. And here's the ultimate example. The one whose glory was never so clear in verse 21. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness By his wounds, you have been healed. Healing doesn't come from getting this world to look like the church. It's getting the church to look like Christ. This is God's family, chosen, 
set apart as holy, to look different than everything else that we see and everything else we experience and everything else everyone else sees and experiences as well. (laughs) What I'm saying is that you can't have authority over my life. (laughs) You can't. And the greater the contrast, the greater the revelation. The greater the contrast in this life, the greater the revelation of real life in Christ. The greater the contrast in my life, the greater the revelation of his life in me. You say, that's not the way I've been living. I've got good news. Verse 25, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Don't you know that you were bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body in this life because you are not your own. We don't live that way. We do our best. We're good people. We're the, maybe the best of these people. In some ways, we can be the worst too. Because this isn't even the point. a life in me that is not of this world. And I'm not going to give you authority over me. There's only one who has authority over me. I will respect the authority that God puts in this, in this structure. I will respect everyone and I will show honor to every single authority that God puts in place. I will respect all of them. I will respect everyone. I will honor them, but I will fear God. If you happen to line up with God, I'm li- then I, it looks like I line up with you. But I'm not choosing one group from this world. I can't choose sides because both sides were created from this world. There is only one side I am on. His kingdom come. His will be done on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. I've already chosen because he's already chosen. He's already chosen me. I can't be on your side or your side or your side. I can only fear God, but I'll respect you. I will love you. I will serve you, not because of you, but because of the life that's in me, because of my fear of God, not because of my fear of you. You think that I'm worried about what people are going to say or what people are going to do? Yes, I'm a human being, but I cast that fear out. And I say, God, God, help me fear you. I bow my knee to you, God. I put my life on this altar, on this ground, because you have already chosen. I can't choose one people over another. You have chosen me, so I choose them Imagine, imagine what it would look like for the world to see that. You were like sheep gone astray. Return to the good shepherd and to the overseer of your soul and stop giving oversight to someone else. In fact, In fact, don't give anyone power or authority in your life that hasn't died for your life. Would you pray with me? God, in my frailty, I've tried to explain what cannot be explained, to touch the holy with the unholy. 
God, I pray that every one of my words would be forgotten, but every one of your words would be remembered forever. Thank you for letting us be a God of a people who've experienced your mercy. And now, right now, if you're watching online or if you're here, would you just bow your head and just create a moment? Maybe you've never given your life away. Maybe you've been in control of your life and you've never known what it is to give your life completely over to God. The prayer takes a few seconds, but it takes the rest of my life to work this out. But taste and see that the Lord is good. And give your life to him. Right now you can say this prayer and just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died for me, that you were buried and that you rose again. And because you're alive, you can be alive in me, so I want new life too. And if you're prayed that prayer, you can raise your hand in the chat or contact us. We want to come alongside you. If you're praying that prayer right now in this moment for the first time, we want to come alongside you right now. I hope I can meet you. If you've been following Jesus for some time, would you just pray this prayer? God, you are the good shepherd the overseer of my soul. Forgive me for at times giving oversight to other things, authority to other things. God, you are the only authority that I revere, that I bow down to, that I fear. So God, I return to you, the good shepherd and overseer of my soul. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen.